Processing um, throughout the duration of, of the meeting. Um, today we'll consider some subordinate legislation. Um, we have two um, briefings from the Minister, one in relation to COVID-19 um, and current issues, and also um, in relation to a request for accelerated passage of the Harbours Bill. We don't have any apologies, although we have um, two members, I understand, will be joining us by Starleaf. So we've um, Keith Buchanan and hopefully Dolores <coughs> Kelly will, will join us at some stage um, during the meeting. I have can no chair. Chair, right? Yes, he can. Ah, yes. <laughs> um, I have no chairperson's business. We just move to the draft minutes um, at page six of your um, meeting packs. Uh, there for the meeting of the 16th of September. Our members agree that they are an accurate reflection of that meeting. Great. Okay, thank you. Mm. Moving then to matters arising, um, that's from page 20 of your packs. Um, do members have any issues in relation to what was discussed? No, all content? Okay, nothing to follow up. At page 29 of your pack, you'll find outstanding committee requests for information. A response has been received from the Minister to correspondence of the 3rd of September, um, and this was issued obviously after the pack was issued. Um, the Minister's response was emailed to members and is tabled, and members will have an opportunity obviously to consider it under correspondence. And there's cor further correspondence has um, arrived this morning, and you'll find that tabled also. And you may want to have a, a, a quick look at that in advance of, of the Minister um, coming before us. Moving then to correspondence at item 5, um, there's a memo at page 34 uh, and in tabled papers. Um, most of the correspondence um, had been obviously forwarded to members over recess. At page 37, with correspondence from the Committee for Finance regarding COVID-19 funding allocations, and I actually think that's actually a, a very good graphic. Um, and it's quite clear then for, for members to, to, to say and to refer refer to. Um, page 50, we have a copy of the Mid-South West Economic Engine Regional Investment Strategy. And we had some discussion in relation to this at our, our strategy day. Um, I know that both Mr Buchanan and Ms Kelly had referred to it. Um, <coughs> Mr Boylan. Yeah, Chair. Um, I can't remember what was agreed or what there is from that, but certainly I'd like the response from maybe send on the department for a response if you get through that report. Um, the likes of class roads and congestion issues and all in that area is unbelievable. You know, if people look at a road network, I mean, even even, even dual carriages and the class roads and that have a great standard, and it's, it's a vast bulk of an area. So I agree. I think Mr. Buchanan raised it the last day, so maybe we should send it on to. The, Department for response in relation to what they're trying to do to address some of those issues, you know. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? I agree with Carol. Yeah. Okay, uh, there was a little bit, maybe, and um, we weren't really clear. Um, Miss Kelly, maybe you could enlighten us. Was this the document that you were referring to when you were talking about ABC Council? Sorry, no. Sorry, this isn't. I'm going to go downstairs. This isn't a great. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I was going to start with that, sorry, Chair, about the document, uh, about the, uh, what we're talking about, basically. Okay, yeah, um, we, we, have a, we have a copy of the Mid-South West Economic Engine. Um, oh, now, yes, that's it. That's it. That was yes. the document that yes. you were referring to? Okay, so there's been a, we're agreed now that we'll send this through to the department for, um, for their consideration. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, page ninety-four with correspondence from um, an individual um, regarding concerns about a government department. Um, perhaps um, Kathy, you might like to give us an update in relation to that. Yeah. Um, basically, what we have to do is seek the individual's agreement to forward the correspondence to the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Public Accounts Committee because it's deemed to be a whistleblower letter. Um, we're waiting for him to come back to get his agreement to forward this, and we can't forward it under data protection rules until we get his agreement. So we're waiting for his response. Okay. Okay. Members content. Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. And then, and we have tabled then the minister's response to committee correspondence. Um, that was arising from our our strategy day. Um, 
on the meeting of the 3rd of, of September. So are members of any comment in relation to that? Are you content to refer to it um, during the Minister's presentation? Okay, thank you. So members agree then to the actions as suggested in the correspondence memo? Okay, thank you. Moving then to... Sorry, the correspondence memo is... Well, that was at the start. Yeah, page. It's just agreed to the actions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's page um, 34. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Moving then to item six, which is subordinate legislation. Um, this is SL1, the regulations EC number 1370 forward slash 2007. Um, public service obligations in transport amendment EU exit Northern Ireland regulations 2020. That's a page 97. The, this rule is subject to negative resolution procedure in the assembly. The purpose of the proposed regulations is to remove references to member states, EU law, the requirement to report to the European Commission as well as replace references to EU directives and regulations with their appropriate UK replacements. These amendments will ensure the retained EU regulation will operate effectively following the completion of the withdrawal implementation period. Ms Anderson. Yes, um, I have no problem with what it's saying in the description about um, the right to two questions um, in relation to regulations. For instance, Regulation 6 says that um, it provides for exclusions from the regulation with respect to financial compensation for public service um, obligations which establish maximum tariffs for pupils, students, apprenticeships and persons with disabilities. mobility. So, for instance, when it goes beyond the removal of, uh, of EU references, but it has an impact like that, I would like to know well, what is happening uh, with that being excluded from this regulation, has it been picked up elsewhere, what's the department doing? So I, I think it would be worth uh, maybe a further interrogation of this because it goes beyond what the explanatory note is telling us. Okay, any other comments or queries? Members content then that we um, sent, we asked that question yeah. sent yeah. back to the, the department yeah. and, and then refer to this again at a future meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Moving then to item seven, which is ministerial briefing, and which is the COVID update and current issues. Um, so at page 101, we've correspondence from the minister um, providing some um, further information. Hansard will record the meeting and we'll welcome um, Nicola Mallon, the Minister for Infrastructure, and Katrina Godfrey, the Permanent Secretary. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Very welcome. <laughs> Okay. I understand, uh, Minister, that you want to make a, an opening statement and then we'll follow up with some questions. Great. Yes. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for the invitation to attend the committee, committee meeting today and to update you on how my department is helping with the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I wrote to you on the 17th of September, and if you're content, I do not intend to repeat the information within that update but rather focus on providing an overview of some of the key issues and then obviously allow some time for members to ask any questions that you may have. Um, I want to start by reiterating my thanks to the committee for your support during the current crisis. The pandemic is something which has dramatically impacted upon each of us in both our personal and our professional lives. Uh, we have seen significant changes to a range of services that my department provides, and I want to personally pay tribute to the staff across my department in DVA and in TransLink and Northern Ireland Water, who have been working exceptionally hard in often very difficult and challenging circumstances. I know you are keen to talk about recovery today, but it is also important to realise that we are still in the middle uh, of this pandemic. With the worrying recent increase in COVID-19 cases, we must be wary of the resurgence of the virus, particularly during the winter months. That is why everything we are doing or planning as a department is done with safety to the forefront and using the latest public health agency guidance and advice. You will be aware of how the pandemic has impacted TransLink. 
NI Water and DVA, with all now having to deal with a substantial reduction in their income. I very much welcome the recent short-term additional investment which the Executive has provided. However, as committee members will know, this does not provide a solution to the longer-term <coughs> funding required to ensure we have public services, critical public services which are fit for purpose, nor does it solve all of the immediate problems we face. Looking at the weeks and months ahead, the investment to avoid an immediate and serious crisis in Northern Ireland water has been very welcome. I have also welcomed the allocations made to TransLink, but I am very conscious of the Finance Minister's insistence that TransLink is moved immediately on to a sustainable footing, and I am very concerned about how, with the scale of the losses in fair income it is facing, this is to be uh, achieved. Uh, given the Finance Minister's timescale. I am concerned that that cannot be achieved without significant consequences uh, to the public transport network uh, that so many of our citizens and workers rely on. Uh, but the Finance Minister and I are due to discuss this shortly, and I will, of course, keep the committee fully updated. You will be aware that I am due to be given new powers by the First and Deputy First Ministers to mm -hmm. enable me to provide support for the taxi, haulage and bus and coach sectors. I have already begun work on this matter. I have written to the Minister for the Economy and the Minister of Finance asking for the critical information they hold and their support to help me to bring forward a scheme, a robust scheme based on evidence um, at the earliest uh, opportunity. I am also due to meet with representatives of all of the sectors next week to advise them on the action taken to date and also advise them of the next steps. These are immediate concerns, but I am also very determined to keep a longer-term strategic focus. To this end, I presented a paper to the Executive at the start of September, highlighting the importance of infrastructure to our economic and social recovery post-COVID. This also highlighted the need for a wider executive focus on our strategic infrastructure. Investment in our water and sewage services was a key element of this paper and also of the New Decade New Approach deal, which re-established these institutions and rightly recognise the need to fund these services. You will have heard last week from NI Water about the substantial amount of investment that is needed to ensure that we have an up-to-date water and sewage service, one that helps to support economic development and recovery. Without this investment, there will be many areas throughout the North where new developments, be it much-needed new homes, hotels, schools or hospitals, will not be able to happen. Before the pandemic, we saw record increases in the use of our public transport network with the introduction of the glider, additional park and ride services and enhancements on our railway network. This shows the value of investment in infrastructure. It can change travel behaviour, reduce the reliance on private cars and help to tackle climate change. I believe we cannot nor should we lose sight of the valuable roles this change will play in our recovery. And you will have noticed uh, my announcement recently around the advancement of park and ride schemes uh, for this financial year. And I hope to be in a position to make further announcements shortly. Uh, recent flooding in Newcastle has also highlighted the critical need to provide flood defences in a timely manner. I have recently committed to invest £6.5 million to alleviate flooding in the area and for the works to be accelerated. Significant investment is also needed to protect other areas here. Finally, as infrastructure projects also have a long lead-in time, I have established a ministerial advisory panel on infrastructure which will advise me on how we might more effectively support long-term strategic planning. This group has already met and is currently taking evidence from a range of stakeholders, and I am keen to hear its recommendations for the future, um, which should be made available to me in early autumn. I know the panel is keen to engage with the committee, and I also very much appreciated the support for an infrastructure commission when we discussed this at a previous uh, committee meeting. Chair, as we move to recovery, my focus is very much on supporting the executive's five-step pathways to recovery plan as we continue to expand our service provision in line with appropriate health and safety guidance. I hope this provides you with a helpful overview, and I am, of course, happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much for, for that. And I think we're all very much aware that we aren't out of um, this pandemic at all. And I think, I suppose, the statements yesterday bring that back into um, real focus. And no doubt there will be then an impact then 
on, on the department, particularly in, in the areas which you've highlighted for both TransLink or for TransLink Northern Ireland Water and again with DVA. Um, and I, they have been the topic of conversation for us over the last number of months. Um, I suppose we are concerned in relation to what we heard from Northern Ireland Water last week uh, and the very difficult situation that they find themselves in. And again, the, what your reference to, to TransLink and the fact that it needs to be put onto a sustainable footing, which of course we all want, um, uh, but we, at the same time we also want a sustainable um, public transport system. TransLink made announcements last week in relation to £20 million savings, and I suppose really on reflection to that, so that's a very a small amount of money really compared to what is required. Um, in the mind of the Finance Minister, what would be required in, of TransLink to make it sustainable? Well, the Finance Minister, um, to my knowledge, hasn't put a figure on it, certainly hasn't shared an efficiency saving figure with me, though has made it clear that efficiencies have to be found. I agree that we should have effective and efficient public um, services. The difficulty, though, for TransLink, as you will know, Chair, is that um, Pre-COVID, it was in a very precarious financial situation because it had relied so much on reserves. These are resource pressures. Therefore, the allocation uh, that was made pre-COVID was about trying to almost put it on a level footing. It was still in a very difficult situation. None of us predicted COVID or the dramatic reduction in the revenue that would be experienced by TransLink. So I do very much welcome the allocations that have come across from the executive. I think we need to be clear that that allocation is not investment in our public transport network. It was to cover loss of earnings for a critical public service to keep it running. And I do want to pay tribute to our TransLink staff because they kept working. They kept and are keeping our key workers, to getting them to and from work. And they have gone over and beyond. But as you say, TransLink has uh, taken on the mantle of finding £20 million in savings. Um, that will lead to redundancies. Um, I have said, while it is a matter for the accounting officer uh, within TransLink, and it is an operational matter, I have said you know, that explore the voluntary redundancy av avenue as much um, as possible. Um, but it is inevitable that redundancies will ensue. And I have to be honest, too, that if further cuts are to be made to TransLink, while this time the public transport network, so the services, have been protected next time round, it's not possible, and so we will have very difficult choices to make as an executive, because as an executive, we own and have a responsibility and a duty for a publicly owned public transport network. Okay, um, and obviously you, you said that there could be significant consequences with that, with regards to, to jobs and obviously with services. Now, I don't think we're in the business really of scaremongering either, um, and, I, and it is about working together in order to um, to protect those services, particularly for rural dwellers, and the majority of us represent rural constituencies, and it would be important because those are they are lifelines to to those people. I completely uh, agree, Chair, and this is about working together. I think what this pandemic has illustrated, and I think the, the statements that were made by the Joint First Ministers yesterday, people want to see their politicians working together, and they want to see them working together to solve the difficulties that they're facing in their daily lives. Um, and I'm very much up for that. I also recognise that a number of members have ambition for a public transport network the same way that I do. I get representations asking me for additional train halts, you know, to expand the rail network, uh, increase our bus service provision. Those are things that I am very keen to try to do. Um, at the moment, the focus is very much though on trying to get TransLink on an even footing to ensure that we do have that critical um, public transport network that so many of our citizens, particularly in the rural areas that, that you have highlighted, rely on. Um, um, when your officials last came in June, uh, we were given figures in relation to um, pre COVID pressures. Have those been revised in any way? Yes, there was. Um, we have made a recent departmental return um, in respect of the latest round of COVID allocations. Um, I'm sure that Katrina can talk to those. Um, we had hoped that at our previous meeting on Thursday that there might have been executive agreement on an allocation. That hasn't happened as yet. We're hopeful that that might happen at Thursday's meeting, but certainly we did. Um, submit revised bids, uh, which saw us release pressures in some areas, um, but I don't have those figures to hand. And maybe okay, I, I see do. from the, the paper that you supplied with us that you have a departmental bid of 51.9 million resource and 29.8 capital. capital. Yeah. Do you have the detail of what that is? 52. Um, yeah, I, I had been rounding them, Chair. But have you been rounding? Right, 52 and 30 was 
was what I had remembered them as, but you're right. Um, I mean, the, the resource bids, um, primarily TransLink, as the Minister has just raised. Um, we do have um, a number of other bids around lost income and other parts of the um, department, particularly DBA, but also um, winter service, which yeah. traditionally um, has been a service that we have been able to fund through late year <coughs> allocations, and that remains the case that we have a bid for. I think it's around seven million. No, about five out of the seven for um, winter pressures, and that's to keep the winter service route. Okay. And the going, capital, but, the um, capital bids were for Northern Ireland Water. I think, if I recall, there was around 15, maybe 15.5. And the remainder was for the A6 because right. we have managed to get construction back on track quite quickly, or certainly much quicker than had been anticipated given the impact of COVID. And so we have submitted a bid to ensure that that can, can progress at pace as well. So those are the two capital bids. And it's, I think it's worth adding, the, particularly in relation to the capital bids, is the, the double whammy in a good sense because, as the Minister says, it would allow us to make further progress, but that also provides its own stimulus. Um, in terms of you know economic response as well, in terms of um, investment. Okay, and there's 8.1 million pounds, um, which was earmarked for the transport sector, still remaining centrally. Um, have you any idea how that is going to be allocated? No decision has been taken on that, but I mean, my understanding is that when I can work up a devise or devise a scheme in respect of the sectors, the hauliers, the buses, um, taxis, and so forth. When we uh, can get a robust scheme, it would be my understanding that a bid would come from my department for that money in the centre. But I have to say, I can't preempt any executive decision on that matter. That would be just my own understanding. Okay. And at this stage, um, have you any anticipated um, figure that you feel that may be required for that particular scheme? So we have written to the Minister for the Economy and the Minister for Finance in previous options paper, the Minister for Economy had um, identified a number of potential options and made um, estimated allocations alongside those. So we have requested that information and that detail and we'll, that will feed into the process of establishing the evidential basis and the best way forward for any scheme. Okay, and you've mentioned that this should be delivered at the earliest opportunity. Do you have a time scale? don't have a time scale as yet. I've asked for um, my ministerial colleagues, if possible, to get that detailed information to me uh, by Monday, because I'm meeting with the sectors on Wednesday. And um, we will then be able to hopefully ascertain the evidential basis and move forward. What we're currently considering, and I'm considering, is the options in terms of taking forward any scheme, whether that will require external expertise to be brought in, whether we can work with CPD. So we're exploring a number of options, and I'm very clear that absolutely this must demonstrate value for money, good governance, but I'm also very mindful that time is of the essence. So those are the criteria within which I'll be ad identifying the best route forward. Okay, and just finally, I have pages of questions I could no, ask. I know, I know. But, <laughs> but I'll, I'll not be greedy. Just one final question with regards to the driving tests. Obviously, um, you anticipated that the backlog, which we, which was to entail those who were key workers and those who had cancelled tests, would be addressed within six to eight weeks. And I know that we're well, we're still the early part of that. But are you on track to achieve that target? And are we still looking at an anticipated opening of the general booking line for the beginning of November? Yes, um, we are, uh, and I sought um, an update as late as last night just to ensure that I would have the most up-to-date information from the committee. Yes, um, we are still on track to clear the 3,800 backlog within the six to eight-week period, commencing from the 1st of September, so that hasn't changed. Okay, thank you. Mr Buchanan? Okay, can you hear me okay? Buchanan? Yes. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just a couple of smaller points. Uh, the NHS uptake minister regarding TransLink obviously knew that according to the NHS staff that you're here, that you're not what the uptake on that was. Are there many available of that service? I don't have figures to hand. We can go back to see um, if we can. We understand it is being utilised, but I can come back and see if I can get a, a, a sense of the, the scale of it for you, Keith. Okay, thanks for that. And just moving on to back onto the chair's point on MOT testing and driver testing. I've, I've had several complaints from constituents regarding the whole call centre. And I had asked a question through the department, but didn't get a sort of an answer. Do you have any idea of numbers of people actually manning, or maybe manning is not the right terminology, now, but uh, answering the phones and taking those bookings? How many people in those centres? Because people have having serious difficulty getting through to that issue. That, and you're, you're absolutely right. We've seen uh, a huge uh, increase in the volume of calls 
on this and you will be aware that because we have in the online booking system live calls, telephone calls are the only modus operandi at present. Um, we've taken a number of steps um, to try to address that. Um, so Capita manage the call centre. Um, they have um, increased the hours that they're manning the calls centre. So it's increased um, for two hours from 5 to 7 p.m. Monday through to Wednesday. We also um, could see that a number of people who were calling the call centre were doing so for other reasons. So we have put in a call messaging system uh, to divert people to other numbers or to NI Direct if their their query does not relate to the specific call centre. Um, and also we have been um, engaging with the haulage industry as well to try to free up capacity in that sense so that they can make uh, bookings through their local test centre as opposed to having to go through the call centre. So by bringing those measures forward, um, we are trying to free up uh, capacity and provide additional capacity. But we are focused in our efforts on getting the online booking system live. So we're on track to see the online booking system restored for um, vehicle tests for HGVs and trailers only from the 1st of October. From the 5th of October, the online system will be open for practical driving tests for all new customers. And then from the 12th of October, the system, the online booking system will be available for vehicle tests for all other um, categories. We're also we're doing it in a phased return because we want to manage the volume uh, in terms of people making applications to the online. In addition to that, as I think we said previously, DFA officials have been working with DVSA in England very closely because our system crashed. So we're trying to mitigate and we are procuring a queuing system and software as well to try to manage the whole, whole online system. So very conscious that it has been a huge difficulty. I do apologise to people who have had difficulty getting through to the call centre, but we're putting in these mitigation measures to try to address that. The significant majority of people book online, so by bringing the online system on, we hope that that will ease the call centre significantly. And you numbers of people actually answering the phones? I don't know the total staff number, but we can again get that to you. I do know that, um, I think it was on Monday evening, when it was the additional two hours alone, it, it serviced, it was about maybe 116 calls, I jotted it down, um, from that two hours alone. So the additional two hours, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, it is helping, but we can certainly get the number of people who are, who are operating in the call centres to you. Okay, um, thank you. Just on the, the chair brought up the point there on the haulage sector, uh, taxi operators and uh, coach operators. And we well, you, you appreciate you can't give us a timeline, but obviously every week goes past. This business has come out, out out of business. Uh, so do you envisage that? And I'm not pressing you, but do you envisage that before Christmas? I would hope to be, but I'm also very um, clear that people have been waiting a long time and they need to have honest information and clarity. So I don't want to raise expectations, but as I said, I'm meeting with the sectors early next week and I have already given and will reiterate my commitment to keeping them fully informed and updated because I do realise that time is of, of the essence. I do appreciate that. So I will be keeping the sectors fully informed and updated along the way. Okay, and just on on the sectors you're meeting next week, can you confirm? Are you meeting the coach operators from Northern Ireland? No one is coming. Are you meeting those? I am. People? I am. Yes. Okay. Right. Final okay. question, Chair. Just on the road safety uh, point, you had uh, it's on our table pack regarding uh, the 20 mile hour speed signs right or in front of schools, which is good and welcomed. The issue I have with said, and I spoke to you personally, uh, Minister, in respect of that. Have you any update on where that sits, just from a point of view of? You've, you've uh, announced funding. You've announced funding for um, groups or whoever can avail of that funding to make roads safer. And obviously, communities will want to put SIDS up in their community. But obviously, if they should, if they can't put them on street furniture or poles, etc. Have you any update on that? Yeah, and this is an issue that you did bring to my attention. And as you say, I've launched the grant scheme where community groups can apply for up to £10,000 for road safety initiatives. I am aware of the um, appeal of um, SIDS and the fact that, you know, through the CPSPs, I think that's how they're pronounced, you know, a lot of communities are very keen to be able to get them. So I know that you did raise the issue about where they are located, and I have asked officials to look into that. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson? 
Thank you, thank you, um, Minister, for for your update and, and for the the paper you sent previously. Um, in the context of the economic recovery, I'm glad to hear around about the E6, uh, particularly about construction on track. Um, that brings me to the E5. We heard that you got this inspector report on the 2nd of September. We know your officials are looking at that. So, do you have a time frame as to when they will come back to you with that analysis, and when you will then report your decision to the committee? Yeah. So, the officials received the um, inspector's report on the 2nd of September. I haven't been given sight of the full report. Uh, what we are doing at present is officials are analysing the recommendations and also seeking legal advice. On it, uh, I have also asked to meet with DSO because I would like to be able to obtain legal advice. I'm very clear that this is a very important strategic project and we need to progress it. So as soon as I get the legal advice, the recommendations for officials, I will be updating the committee and um, announcing the next steps on it. When I'm dealing with roads, can I ask you about the A2 Bunkrana Road, yes. uh, particularly in the context of economic recovery? I've met with DFI roads, we've met with the retail units on each side of the road, we have looked at the design of the road. The retail units have brought forward some suggested modification uh, to the design. We're galvanising support, obviously, across, uh, across the city and district for the A2 Bunkrana Road, and I would ask you to try to come up with a solution, like what happened in Crescent Link. We had to make sure that there was exit uh, points into that so that you could get into Tesco's or, or whatever retail unit you wanted to go into. So the solutions was found there, and I believe a solution can be found here that satisfies the retailers and those who are outlining the concerns with the current design. It's only a small modification. No, no, thank you for that. And you will be aware that I allocated money in the budget to the strategic roads. This was one of them. I met with the local business owners in the area. It was in March, just before lockdown, mm -hmm. yep. and to listen to their concerns. Um, and I also am aware that they held a number of site meetings with elected representatives in the area last week or so. And yep. um, so I've said to officials, you know, I'm always keen that we work in partnership. I think when many heads come together, when you bring strategic roads information and you marry that up with local knowledge, you get to a better outcome. So I have asked my officials to be engaging um, with the local stakeholders and I would be keen to try to find a solution as I decide on the next steps forward so very yeah. aware of it. Yeah because co-design is crucially important. Um, can I ask you Minister about an update on the reservoir bill and yeah. um, the transfer of functions. We know when we were engaging with your uh, officials that they, when they outlined the technical guidance notes on plan and policy um, in proximity to reservoirs and they recognised the shortfall of the current process. Now we have got, um, obviously this has to be done in the context of safety, but there are a number of projects, for instance in the Glens, and then we're looking at McGee and also Fort George that could be adversely affected unless we get this right. So we would like to know around the transfer of functions, but more primarily as well as in the context of safety, but the decisions can be taken to allow the potential development to go forward. Yeah, no, I totally agree, and I think, particularly on the issue of housing, um, you know, we have a huge need to be building more homes. That's why I'm always advocating for investment in our wastewater and water infrastructure. But as you say, we need to be making sure that development is in safe places, and that means when they're in close proximity to reservoirs. Um, you'll know that the um, the Act hasn't been enacted because it was wrongly transferred to DERA. Uh, where it currently stands is that. Um, TO, Executive Office, have agreed a transfer of functions to my department, okay. and so we await them bringing it forward to the Executive. You have no time frame on that? No, um, I, I don't, but we can ask Executive Office for an update. Just finally, just on, on the issue of Brexit, 99 days away and the clock is ticking, and as you know, it's getting louder. There are 23 of the common frameworks that are within your department, uh, transport, aviation, regulation, driver hours, rail safety and rail passengers' rights. And then when we had NI Water here last week and we were talking about the chemicals for the purification of water, and they had said whilst, um, whilst they believed the supply chain um, would enable them to get access to them because of the disruption of the supply chain, it would cost more. Um, so it's just to see if we could have an update. I know we talked to you before about uh, the 23 common frameworks, but to see how further forward the department is about taking those forward. 
obviously work on all of that and continues in respect of Northern Ireland Water. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, they have a number of no-deal Brexit contingency plans in place around um, additional stocking of chemicals, rerouting to ensure there was a critical supply route. So that contingency work is ongoing and they're building on it. In terms of the common frameworks, I think from my department's perspective, the hazardous substances common framework is probably the most advanced. It was approved at the beginning of September and work is continuing on its full implementation. In the other areas, officials are working towards development of provisional frameworks by the end of the transition period. I think we are all agreed that the lack of information and detail that's coming forward from British government you know, is a huge concern, but certainly my department is working as very closely with uh, officials in DFT to ensure that they are very aware of the unique circumstances faced in Northern Ireland, very clear with my officials as well that we must be transposing everything that we can. We must be doing what we can to ensure high alignment and that we must have contingency planning in place. Uh, but as you say, we're, the clock is ticking and it is an area of huge and growing concern. Because of the dangers of the chemicals, uh, NA water can only stock for seven weeks? Seven weeks, that's correct, yes. Okay. Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, you're very welcome this morning, uh, Minister, indeed. Uh, could I start just by referring back to the period of summer there that we had the serious flooding, particularly in the Newcastle area, but it was obviously problems wide as well. And I'd just like to thank your staff for their efforts during that particular time. And yourself as well, we contacted in addition to some flooding issues which were sorted out, and also some taxi issues as well, which, which came to fruition too. So thanks, thanks for that. See, on, on the flooding issue itself, but when an unexpected turn of events takes place like that, there, obviously it's not within maybe a specified budget or so. But where does that money come from, or where does the loss go in relation to the budget? Does money have to be moved around, or because obviously it's quite substantial. Yeah, substantial I can maybe times. bring in the permanent secretary first on the technical aspects of things. Yeah, I mean we we operate in in a fairly flexible way, um, David, so that that allows for reaction. Um, when it's needed and you would have seen that very clearly and in fact the minister saw it at first hand in, in newcastle a couple of weeks ago so we do have teams that are able to be on the ground very 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 quickly and that is covered it may mean that some other things take a wee bit longer getting done but that is covered you know from just the way we operate our, our budgets so that we can and it happens all the time it happens on roads when there's incidents yeah, yeah. It happens with the winter services so the guys and girls we have on the ground are enormously flexible and you know, uh, as, as you've said yourself, very impressive in terms of their emergency yeah. response, um, which is huge, hugely heartening for me. Yeah, just from a lay person's point of view, obviously you see the operation yeah. going on, and you know mm -hmm. that's cost on absolutely. Mm -hmm. money. And um, you wonder where that's going to impact on other services. Yeah. And, it, and it may mean some other things get done in slightly slower time, but because it's prioritised and, and it is a response service, it means you go to where the need is greatest at the time then in terms of the longer term it is around planning to take forward some of the um the major schemes that would stop this happening so it's in many ways classic triage you're responding to the immediacy but also putting in place the arrangements to try and stop that happening in future and um the minister's been very clear yeah. around the priority to be given to the alleviation scheme in newcastle yeah there's about forty-five thousand properties here that are at risk of flooding um from rivers to sea or surface water and they require infrastructure you know improvements so the reality is that this is going to become an increasing uh, occurrence through climate change through you know the, the lack of investment in our water and wastewater infrastructure as well it's almost like pardon the pun a perfect storm so it is something that you know more people are going to have to uh, deal with and so it is going to become an area requiring more and more investment i mean i was it was shocking to see the scenes in Newcastle and while I was delighted to be able to help residents there, there are residents in, in other places where you're not able to provide the support that they actually need in terms of long-term solutions and that's a frustration as well. So it's certainly an area that I'm very conscious of and one that is going to require additional investment going forward, that's without question. And possibly one that in the past didn't get the attention you know, yeah. that we now see with climate change and, and other events that really warranted. So, you know, the, over the last number of years, I think understanding has developed significantly in terms of the infrastructure we take for granted until something happens. 
And there is opportunities. We look very much at hard infrastructure, but there are huge opportunities. You know, I was recently up in Devis Mountain and we were discussing there the potential of Belfast Hills to help with like a, a soft solution to water drainage. And um, so there is things I think that we can be doing that are more cost effective, but are actually good in terms of building resilience into flood defences. It's something I'd be keen to, to try to explore. Okay, thank you. Just on Northern Iron Water then. Uh, We've heard a lot about the increase in the capacities and all this, particularly through the provincial towns, maybe not so much the city in relation to where I'm coming to here. It's been put to me by some people in local government that there has been movement away from the, uh, the closures, buildings becoming empty and whatnot and stuff in long term, and the deductions don't actually come off their figures. Okay. Could someone look into that situation whereby it can obviously keeps on increasing because of new build, but on the other side of things, there's factories disappearing, there's large oh, housing areas, and particularly high-rise flats in Lauren, for instance. People, they, they're indicating that those figures don't aren't being deducted. Okay. But could I leave that with you? It's just yeah, a, we, we I can come back. Game, you see, and I, I thought it'd be a bit of a convoluted answer. I thought, but yeah, no, no, I understand the point. I understand the point. So let us go away and ask Northern Ireland Water about how it verifies its figures in terms of new development and then spaces and, and capacity that's freed up, and how it arrives at its overall figure. And we can share that yeah. with the committee. That will be good. Thank you. Uh, the road safety strategy yes. uh, is an indication of the 30th of November, which is roughly just two months away. For completion of that, the replacement of the road. Has it actually started? Yes, I've met with officials on it. Um, and I think that the issue for me was when we looked at the road safety strategy, it had a huge number of action points. And the, the thought that I had was could we have a more outcomes focused approach and could we look at see what they were doing in Scotland, England, mm -hmm. and other places to see, you know, can we have a more effective and targeted road safety strategy? So officials have gone away and are compiling that, and I'm due to meet with them again to try to finalise that. Also, due to meet with the PSNI as well. Officials are obviously engaging with PSNI and others, but I'm keen to do that myself. Um, I'm conscious that the strategy runs out at the end of this year, so we're keen to get an improved road safety strategy that sits with the outcomes approach of the program for government but also very much with the kind of active travel agenda as well quickly then to the 30th of November. yeah there's been some slippage with covid there's no doubt about that but we're very keen we see the importance of it to get it done as quickly as possible and to share yeah. it with the committee i'm from angle where i'll be the chairperson of a well, one of the few road safety committees still operating in northern ireland actually so uh and we did some good work done through the department as well. So it was an advantage in some of these local setups. I agree. As well. I agree. That, that would be considered coming okay. back again too. Special events. Uh, I know the, the the responses don't really finish until tomorrow. I think it is. But, but is there any early indications of that? And I know you were only able to meet Mo Farah. The other I know. There, you were, you were missing. Constituency <laughs> stuff. Uh, so you know, you can see how important road closures can be to events and special. Of it special events so yeah uh, is there any early indication at the minute of where that's going because a lot of people were in the yeah. country should have been very early yeah no i haven't i've wanted to wait until it was completed in order to get an analysis um my instinct tells me that um the views will be overwhelmingly in favor of changing it um and that was what anticipated um and precipitated me looking at this issue um i know that Mr. Moore had brought people from a range of running clubs and different sporting organisations up to meet with me to discuss it. And even at a local level, it was an issue of huge concern. So I suspect, don't want to preempt it, but there will be a clear signal that it is overly burdensome on local running and sports clubs. Um, and we need to then identify a, a way forward that, yes, you know, councils have a role to play, but also we're doing something that doesn't stymie people trying to live healthy active lifestyles and also trying to raise money for charities and other hugely good causes in their community okay. so we can get a, an update once we collate the responses okay and just i know there's been a number of questions on translink and its budgets and its outworkings going forward but there, there's been some rumors in the last few days of a situation where the clippers town halt in carrick fergus has been rumored for closure now it's only came to my ears in the last couple of days by local folk uh, if you're going to try and get people onto public transport, that would be one that, that wouldn't be wanting to be done away with. But the excuse being anti-social behaviour, 
my brother there potentially wanted to close it at certain doors or something like that. Okay. But could I leave that with you as well in relation to Clippers Town Hall? Yeah, certainly. I, that's something that I'm absolutely not aware of, but I can raise with it's Translink. Been brought up in recent okay. days. Then. Okay. Okay. I'll leave it at that. There's just a lot there. So. Loose. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I would declare just a half to you as I was previously employed of Translink and a member of Arts and North Dunbar Council. And my stepfather's a quality manager for the A6. Um, a, a couple of questions. Um, obviously, we've had some discussions in relation to the future of Translink. Um, I'm very concerned to see what we're in trajectory we're going to here in terms of the potential time bomb around air quality and uh, pollution and congestion. Um, a public health message for a number of months has been to avoid using public transport. So people have been using their private car. Um, and I just wanted to know what efforts are being made by the department um, to have a recovery strategy for the use of public transport so that we're not having a situation where actually coming out of this there's more private car usage um, and that the impact that will have upon communities because I think this is a, a key thing that we need to make sure that when we're coming out of this and once eventually this pandemic will pass that people are returning to use public transport. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I share. Um, as somebody who really believes in public transport, we are sending out a message that you should only travel in tr public transport if it's essential and, and necessary. It doesn't seem to sit right, but the truth is that we're in a public health crisis and we have to follow the public health uh, advice. Um, TransLink, I think, has demonstrated its responsibility for its passengers by implementing a range of measures, uh, screens, uh, no cash policy, cleaning of buses, there's a whole regime that it has put in to keep its passengers safe, uh, both in uh, bus stations, rail stations, and also actually on the buses and trains themselves. Um, we are very conscious that we need to be encouraging people back and safely. I think the key thing in the recovery strategy is to ensure that we're able to maintain services. Um, if we don't maintain services and ensure the public transport is accessible, then people will never make the shift back from cars back onto public transport. So that's why I think it's absolutely critical that we are able to maintain the investment. The other avenue, though, for me to explore, and I referenced the park and ride announcement, is about having an amalgamated journey. So if you can walk or cycle to the local train station, you have some more security to, 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 to store your bicycle and then get on the public transport. It's about enhancing that whole experience. Uh, the executive has also begun to think around um, car parking that we own uh, as government and buildings and what we can do there to encourage people to use public transport or find more active ways to get to and from work. There's also a responsibility on employers. So it seems that it's incongruous at the moment to be talking about the importance of public transport but simultaneously telling people don't need travel in it when it's essential. Um, but we will just have to keep doing things in line with public health advice um, and encourage as many people as possible to safely use our public transport network, maintain the services, and then the third strand for me is enhancing it. If we look at rail connectivity in the northwest, for example, it requires significant improvements, and I am a firm believer that if you build it, they will come. So those are the three strands that we would take in terms of our approach to recovery. Um, I thank the Minister for her response. Um, you know, I, I live beside the railway line and I see the train going past me and um, it's devastating to see the level of patronage on that after such work was done to increase the level of usage. But if we cut those services and we're coming out of this pandemic, then how are we going to increase usage of public transport? Because the clear barriers will be then created in terms of use of it. So I think it's really important that we you know, invest and, and encourage people coming out of this to use public transport. And one of other aspects which you talked about was about sustainable travel. Um, and what work is being done by the department to proactively work with councils and other bodies to bring forward bids for funding? Because that's what you need. You need bids for funding, and we need a real concerted effort to have that. Because, you know, in my own council area, we only got twenty-five thousand pounds as part of the recent Greenway thing, and, we, and I understand there's work underway around that. But what work is being done with the councils so that we can have the Greenway strategy delivered? Yep. So um, we have been writing out to councils, uh, and I've been trying to meet with councils. I'm actually due to meet with Lisburn and Castlereagh after this, um, so I'm trying to be proactive. I've met with Newry, um, Belfast, Dublin, or Belfast and Derry, um, and we're saying to them, please get the proposals to us. 
uh, the challenge for me is that um, I don't think the change from on high works. I don't think coming and imposing change in communities around where cycling should be uh, will work. We need to be working in partnerships. So I've said it needs to be bottom up. And I think that the council is the most appropriate vehicle for bringing the proposals forward. In saying that, some councils have brought forward more proposals than others. Um, I would encourage members to be engaging with their councils, to ask them to be submitting proposals to my walk-in and cycling champion. The other challenge here is that it's capital monies and it has to be spent within this financial year. That means that some projects will necessarily be at a more advanced stage than others. But what I have been saying to councils is, you know, I am committed, I can't preempt future budget allocations, but I'm committed to this agenda. And if they can work up proposals even this year that would be ripe for funding next year, then I would be very keen to do that. So we're taking a very proactive approach. We had good uptake in terms of the greenways. I know that you might be a bit disappointed. Um, we're doing the park and ride schemes uh, as well. Um, so very keen to work with councils and encourage members to be encouraging their own party councillors, but also their council officers to be being as creative as they can and energetic as they can to get proposals to us so that we can support them. Just, just one last question, Chair. Just around the MOTs, um, driving licences. Obviously, nearly every MLA and councillor has been contacted with concerns around yeah. that, um, and the decision was made not to issue the TECs for four-year-old vehicles and to move towards getting people to ring up and, and book it. I would just urge the minister to ensure that when we're moving to the next stage, that there is the capacity there to deal with this, because. I'm really worried that we're just going to get a tsunami of complaints about people trying to book uh, things online and just get really frustrated. So if we're going to do it, we need to have the resources there and do it right. Otherwise, people are just going to get extremely frustrated. I know my, my TEC runs out next year, so you know, I, and I'm happy to go and get the MOT, but I just need to make sure that I can go online and book it because the experience that some people have had would, would drive you around the bend, really. Uh, 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 and on that issue of the MOTs, maybe for an update, um, the Craig Avon Test Centre is going to be handed back to DVA on the 20th. Did I preempt your question, Cal? Yeah, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you're, do you want me to hold that's back? That's the 15 questions down now, Chair. Sorry. Right. Think of yeah. sorry. So, yeah, um, it's being handed back to the DVA on the 20th of September, so we'll be carrying out the practical driving tests from the 1st of October. Belfast is due to be handed back on the 2nd of October, and we hope to then be carrying out MOT tests around the 5th as soon as we get the, the lifts installed. So the Belfast situation, because it's a big test centre, will help in dealing with the capacity of MOTs. To reassure members as well, we have also uh, are on a recruitment drive. So we have uh, recruited two temporary vehicle examiners. Uh, they will require very minimal training because they're former employees. We are also in the process of recruiting 12 temporary vehicle examiners to assist with the MOTs and also in the process of recruiting 12 permanent uh, vehicle examiners. So we're looking at a recruitment of, of 26 additional vehicle examiners. That will help with the MOT, but will also free up the dual role examiners as well to help with the practical driving test side of things. But I understand it is confusing. Uh, we have agreed an updated comms plan as well um, yesterday, which will be rolled out, trying to very simply using GIFs explain to people what, who you need to contact. And also, I would encourage members to um, direct their constituents to the Check Your Status MOT website, because you can go on and see then if you have an MOT or a TEC when it expires. And it, I, we have found that that is helping to clear up some of the confusion. Thank you. Okay, and, but just on that, uh, I think it still would be useful to reinforce the message that uh, people have an obligation to keep their, their yes. vehicles uh, roadworthy, because I've heard of a number of instances where, you know, because we don't have an MOT appointment, well, sure, everything's fine. But I think that message probably needs to come out again and reinforced. I completely agree, and I always try to reinforce that safety message and that responsibility message when we're commenting on it. Um, but yeah, I, I thank the, the committee as well for reinforcing that message. I think it's very, very important that it is the sole responsibility of the owner of the vehicle. It's not just a matter of responsibility a week or a few days before your actual MOT test. I think it is important, Chair, because some people will view that when you bring your car to the garage just in advance of an MOT when you actually should bring it to keep it roadworthy. Mr Beggs? Just to follow up on that last point, I agree it does need to be uh, reinforced. I was talking to a few local garages, and uh, they have had a, who, who did a lot of MOT preparation work, and their business virtually disappeared. Yeah. So there are there is a public safety message that we need to get across there that people need to keep their, their vehicles roadworthy. Um, in terms of public public transport and the financial pressures, 
Um, you've said you've been in discussions with, with the finance minister and with, with uh, TransLink. Have TransLink communicated to you the range of options that they are having to consider so that you in turn can transmit that to uh, the, the, the finance minister so there is no ambiguity as to what might happen depending on what funds becomes available? Yes, I have submitted detailed executive papers, both on the Northern Ireland Water Set and on TransLink. Uh, we have also shared with the Department of Finance um, all of the accounting in respect uh, of TransLink uh, as well, so that we're being very open and honest and transparent in terms of you know, what money is coming in, where it's going, uh, and what it's being used for, and if it's not there. Um, the difficulties that will ensue. Um, in terms of the £20 million savings, as I said, assurances have been given that it won't impact the, the network and the provision of services. It will result, it will result um, in redundancies. Um, but I've also been very clear with executive colleagues that if we are in a situation where further cuts have to be made, then we cannot guarantee that it won't affect services. And we're into the realm then of trying to do analysis of service provision based on profit and not on need. To me, that's the antithesis of a publicly owned public transport network and doesn't sit at all with the executive's obligations. Um, so, you know, I'm due to meet with the, the finance minister to discuss these matters, um, and I'm sure we could share with the committee, you know, the details that we have provided in respect of TransLink in particular. I think that would be very helpful. Then. Thank you. Then, in terms of the test centres and MOTs and PSV and other vehicle testing, uh, I'm pleased that, you ha that uh, DVA has hired a considerable number of new staff. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming that additionally during that last uh, six months that some staff will have come to retirement age as well. So are we satisfied <coughs> that this is uh, uh, sufficient sa staff to meet the considerable demand that will be there? And is there the capacity to flex, to put in additional shifts? Because I know people are desperate to keep their vehicles on the road and will drive long distances or go in uh, late or early hours in order to keep their vehicle on the road. So will that capacity be there and will DVA be flexing so that those who need a test can get one? Yes, uh, is the answer, but we have to do everything after we have completed a, a risk assessment and in line with public health advice. It would be remiss of me to say to people, yes, we will have capacity back to pre-COVID levels. And um, because of the additional measures that have to be taken in place to keep staff and customers safe, you know, that will have a knock-on effect. So people will have to wait longer for their MOTs. What we're trying to do is to maximise capacity that we have and to be utilising the TEC system so that nobody is disadvantaged from it. Okay. You mentioned it's affect capacity. By um, what capacity does COVID uh, how is it going to link? By what percentage is it going to link in the test cycle? Because you know that's that's a major thing that has to be planned and worked in. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that some thought is going behind. Uh, do we know what that is? It, it very much depends on the size of the test centre, Roy. To be honest, every one of them is is different. So you know, some of them are, are relatively small. You know, my local one in Down Patrick's just a three lane centre. Um, Belfast much much bigger. Um, so. The key thing, and I have to say, the health and safety lead people in the department itself and in the agency have worked absolutely tremendously. The key thing is to take each site, the business it does, and then to work out the risk assessment on that basis. So you can have generic principles for a risk assessment, but it only comes live in the actual workplace itself. And the minister is absolutely right. The key thing here. Um, for staff is the reassurance that they and, and their customers are safe, um, the social distancing measures, the fact that you might have to um, take a bit longer between, you know, between vehicles, but there's no easy percentage that says, you know, it's 20% it's or 30% down because it depends on, a, on each individual test centre. Typically, um the driver myself or someone else mm -hmm. would have a seat alongside uh, the test facility. Um, I hope that if customers cannot stay inside the centre, that a canopy or some sort of shelter will be pro provided. Can you assure me that that will be the case and that customers will not be standing in the rain as has happened with others? others? We have been looking and I'd asked officials to scope out options on that. Um, it, my, my view was that you put up a canopy and it's straightforward. It actually isn't straightforward because people will congregate and not socially distance in a canopy. 
Um, so it throws up on the face of these things. It, it, there's always complications that you never foresee. So we have been trying to work through options. I think one of our key concerns had been the driving instructors because they repeatedly go to a centre, so it has a big impact. We've carried out a number of risk assessments and we are looking at utilising reception areas following risk assessments uh, where social distancing can be provided to ensure that at least the driving instructors have shelter because they are there for longer, longer periods, periods on multiple occasions yeah. as opposed to individual customers. In saying that, you know, as we approach winter, I am very mindful and we do say when we're asking people to come from their MOT, we do advise up front that there is no sheltered provision at present. And mindful of the weather for them to you know be prepared accordingly so we are exploring options but i am pleased that we're moving to a solution for the driving instructors at least at this stage like other members i too have been picking up pressures and, and concern about uh, those who are seeking to have a driving test and and, and delays uh, that they're experiencing um and uh, there's been an indication that uh, instead of instructor has it perhaps six or seven tests per day down to four or five so again what percentage capacity has uh, has been affected and the ability to test because there's six months pent up demand here and uh, to what degree are additional um, testers being employed and looking at extending shifts etc so that we can meet the considerable pent up demand that is there. And, and you mean for the practical driving tests, yes. Roy? So um, pre-COVID, um, they would have carried out six each per day. That has reduced to five, but that's because of the additional measures of cleaning vehicles and the, you know, the social distance and all of that. So that is um, down. But um, as I've said previously, we have on our books 40 dual road examiners who can carry out vehicle testing, but also the practical driving tests. One of the purposes of the recruitment drive that I just spoke about for the vehicle examiners is it will be freeing up more of the um, dual officers that can carry out the practical driving tests. So when you boil it down, what I've asked for officials is for figures. So if we work from the, the figure that uh, pre-COVID, there was around 4,000 tests carried out per month with the existing examiners and the additional capacity, officials have said to me that they are confident that they can carry out 3,500 tests um, per month. So it's not exactly at the same capacity as before. It's it's slightly less. Um, but we are having to be honest with people that because of all the addition mitigations, people are going to have to wait slightly longer for their practical driving test than they would have before. Sorry, just to be clear, you're saying even with this, these additional staff, you're predicting the backlog will get longer? Uh, well, what we're saying is that even with the additional staff, um, we will be carrying out just under what we would have been doing pre-COVID. Now, that's before we look at increasing the hours. As you've said before, we are looking to see, can we carry out the driving tests into the evenings? Can we carry them out on Sundays as well, which would provide additional capacity? But obviously, we have to make sure that people's driving conditions are the right conditions in order to be testing their ability to drive. I, mean, I, I fully appreciate that, but I'm getting quite alarmed at the thought that the six months waiting list will get longer if we're not meeting the, the normal demand levels. And I would ask that you and your colleagues would look at how we can at least provide more than what would normally be provided in order to shorten the backlog that is there. I mean, that, that this, is, this is a major concern coming. It's affecting people getting to work. Uh, a couple of key workers have been in touch with me, and I'll, I'll correspond with the relevant uh, agency uh, on, this, on the second one who just got in touch. But, but uh, we have to surely provide at least the capacity that was needed before and start to eat away at that six months uh, pent up demand. And I agree. I think the difficulty though is that with risk assessments and with the physical capacity of space and people's ability to work, the truth is that we're not going to be able to deliver a capacity over and beyond what we were doing before, right? But what we're saying is, we are recruiting additional um, staff to be able to increase the number of tests. We are looking at the additional hours in the evening. We are looking at Sunday um, service. But also, I have to be mindful that you can't book a practical driving test unless you complete your theory test. The theory test was not accessible for a number of months. So there are people who would not, who would have in normal circumstances been in that backlog, but they're not because they haven't yet been able to sit their theory test, even though that did resume in July. So we are very mindful and we are working. Um, but I have to be cautious about lifting uh, pre-COVID exact figures, adding them up for six months and, and saying that that is the level of demand. Certainly the level of demand is high and we are doing everything that we can to work through it. Well, I hope there will not be considerable delays in the, in the theory test because that will give you a signal on what is coming through. Final question then about potholes. Um, 
in the past, I've been told that a porthole has to be very deep before it'll be touched, and I've seen it marked, and then no work happened because it wasn't deep enough. Uh, what's the current depth before work is carried out? Is it four inches? Is it two inches? Um, because uh, that, that is, there's real safety implications of, of, of this uh, maintenance work not happening, and have you bid for additional funds to enable it to, them to be repaired? Yes, I always bid for additional funds, Minister Murphy. I think I'm the bane of his life. Um, so yes, I always um, bid for uh, additional money. And I'm also very clear that I, I, I term it getting the basics right, not to say demean anything derogatory, but it is fundamental. If you're not fixing people's potholes on streetlights, then you're not providing them with this minimum service that they require. And you will know that I've allocated money, money to ensure that we have a 12-month repair um, ability for streetlights. But obviously, we have so many potholes that's a result of years and years of underinvestment and patching that is not good for a road network and is also not value for money. You'll also know that the independent Barton report said that we should be spending £143 million per annum on maintaining our road network. We are nowhere near that. I don't have any allocation to be anywhere near close to that. From my memory, and I would need to go back and check, I think it is, it's around is it 55 I will come back. There is, there is depth, there is depth right. against which potholes are assessed, but we can get that detail to you. Just they are prioritised in terms of in using what resources we have. There is a priority approach so that they, the ones that carry the most risk are top priority. If the public is not satisfied with deep holes not being repaired, and it's a waste of resources, several people visiting it, and not no work being carried out. And I completely uh, agree with that. And if I had additional funding, um, it's certainly an area that I would seek to have dramatic improvements on. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And just, just to follow on from Roy's point in relation to the backlog, could you maybe clarify the issue around um, testing staff's annual leave entitlement? Because I understand that most staff um, weren't redeployed and maybe didn't take their leave um, during the COVID period. Um, and I've been told by a number of sources that they're now being instructed to do so by the end of January. Um, perhaps you can confirm or deny that, but also whether this has been actually factored into um, addressing the backlog, because obviously if you've got a number of staff who are going to be taking time off and substantial time off. Certainly this is not an issue that I'm aware of, but I'm conscious that that would be an operational matter. So I'm not sure if yeah. you're able to deal with that or we can come back to address that issue no, by DBA. The Chair is quite right. It's actually um, a requirement right across the whole of the civil service. Um, the limit to carry over of annual leave is nine days and the only exceptions to that are where you have been prevented from taking leave. Um, it's also working, worth working or pointing out that Leave carryover actually carries a cost in terms of every department's annual accounts and the liabilities then that it has. So it's not something that doesn't come without a financial cost. So right across all departments, um, the message has gone out very clearly that staff should be encouraged to take leave. Now we have to manage that and the DBA chief executive is managing that in the context of the backlog and the priority to getting people um, tested, whether it's themselves or, or their vehicles, so there is a careful management. Um, but it is also really important that, uh, and I know trade unions would, would agree with me on this, that staff take breaks as well. So we're managing a really challenging situation. Um, we probably, at the end of July, had probably you know, considerably less leave taken than we would have done in a normal year in common with all departments. And it's something right across every department that we're working at, looking at, and trying to find the right balance. I suppose my concern is that why we would welcome the efforts which have been made to recruit staff, essentially then they're coming in to, um, to cover for, for staff leave, as opposed to adding any, actual, any real value in addressing the backlog. It is, a, it is a challenge. Staff have rights to leave. It's really important that they are able to take their leave, and it is one of those things that at every level of management we all juggle with, try and make sure we have the cover for services to continue while not eroding the, the rights of employees as well. Okay, thank you. Ms Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for coming this morning. Um, some of what I was going to ask has been covered, but um, just a few points coming out, and I suppose on the back of... Uh, what Roy has said there around the, the driving tests. I've been engaging with driving instructors um, you know, for the last number of months and just as things 
are starting to get to back to some sort of normality. There's still a few wee um, queries that they have had. Um, they'd ask just, I know in the, the table papers, there, there is reference to it around the, the longer duration test, the ADIs, and, and that. Is there any time scale for when they will resume, or you know, are we still working on that? Yeah, officials are working on that. Um, obviously, it's a it's a longer testing, and we're trying to work through the priorities. So it hasn't. It's a service that hasn't resumed mm -hmm. as yet. But I've asked officials to, to resume it as safely and as quickly as possible. So as soon as I'm able to give a time frame, I can share it. Okay. And and one of the other issues I'd re I'd, I'd spoke very um, recently to to one of the representatives in DVA, and he was very very helpful around. Um, driving instructors access to centres while um, a test has taken place and I know some centres are allowing, allowing them indoors particularly as we're coming into the winter months but there seems to be inconsistency still that some aren't so is there any um, work being done to try and make that more consistent approach because they are very conscious even this week you can see the change in the weather so it's quite difficult for people to stand outside well no, for an hour I agree, so. and it has to be done on a test centre basis because each will require its own individual risk <laughs> assessment so some centres have lent themselves to finding this shelter solution much more quickly than others but we're working through all of them because okay. as we said like the driving instructors they're there are multiple multiple times and with the weather they do need to have provision of shelter, so we're just working through risk assessments for the remaining centres. Okay, kind of well, that's, that's fair enough. Um, and on, on the, I suppose, the more basic maintenance issue, street lighting is something that's been raised with me. Um, and as I say, as we're coming into the darker evenings, it's something that becomes more prominent um, as, as people see lights that are out. I've been experienced locally, we've experienced difficulties with response times to repairs. So, for example, um, a, house, a, house, a full housing estate has been off in, in Bestbrook, my area, Carrick Vista, um, for the last week and a half, two weeks, and still no sign of repairs. And I think because it's a, it's a quite a, a block that's out, um, a concern me, because usually that's prioritised. So it, it's just to say, is this an issue right across? I know historically there always has been issues with street lighting, and, and it's, it's, um, they're always at capacity, but it's just... It, Usually that is something that's repaired fairly quickly and it has been reported a number of times now. So is that a one-off or do you think, is it a problem right across? Certainly this isn't an issue that's being brought in terms of group outages mm -hmm. because as you rightly say, group outages are a priority. I'm just wondering, I don't have the specific detail and I'll take it from you and look at it myself, okay, whether you. it's an issue around um, NIE as opposed to DFI. Sometimes you find that that might be the case. Um, but if you give me the details, I can look into it when I go yeah. back up to the office. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, just to suppose on um, the 20 mile an hour zones, and obviously, you know, it's very, very welcome. Within the limits, I suppose, of the 100 schools, there's, there's quite a lot have been missed out. And in my own area, I think for the whole area in South Armagh, there's maybe only one school have been lucky enough to benefit from it. Can you say that there's a commitment there to extend that further? Um, and one one issue, I suppose, that, that concerns me, because a lot of my constituency is fairly rural, and, and one school, I suppose, that I use an example all the time is Killian Primary School, where there's a 60-mile-an-hour zone um, outside, or 60-mile-an-hour road out there outside the school because of the national speed limit. Um, so I don't even know if they would be able to, would they meet the criteria for that in, in future rollouts? based on that because or would it be a legislative change for rural roads that are not national speed limit if that makes sense yeah and maybe we can leave the, the legislative element but in terms of the the 100 schools um the level of demand for this was always going to um, yeah. exceed um, and we tried to take a fair approach so we uh, divided it equally across the four divisions um, and it was also rural proof. I know some members did have concerns about that. Um, I, again, can't preempt what future allocations mm -hmm. are going to come to my department, but I have been clear and have been communicating out to schools who weren't successful that my commitment is that we would see a further rollout of this scheme and that um, additional schools would be included uh, next year. There was the same matrix that was applied across, so kind of traffic volume, speed, you know, the collisions and all of that assessed. So we have agreed, uh, you know, the first tranche is, is the 100 schools this year, but I'd be very keen to see it rolled out next year. And we did assess every school, again, fair, to, to, to take a fairer approach. We assessed every school in each division. Um, so we're able to then move on to the, the next tranche. In terms of the legislative aspect to it. Yeah, there is a, a process that just has to be worked through. Um, but it's reasonably straightforward, so I, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about, about it. Okay. And the Minister says we're very clear that this should be a ruling priority. Um, there's also 
always cases where there are complexity, <coughs> so perhaps schools near junctions where mm -hmm. you'd be keen to do something, but it mightn't have been possible this year. So yeah. rather than losing the opportunity for somebody else, it's finding ways of working through solutions in, in local areas. Yeah, I suppose my concern was just that, they, that because of the, the legislation in terms of, of those types of roads, that would almost knock them out completely anyway. But that's great to hear because I think like for that one in particular, they have to cross the road for break times and things like that. Now, I would say most cars or vehicles can't go 60, but they can still, you know, th there's nothing really there to make them slow. And it's, it's very narrow roads, just very, very dangerous. So okay. it's one that's continually highlighted to me. Um, in terms of the Transport Regulation Unit, and I know they hold public inquiries um, against operators who may not be complying with regulations and standards, um, I am aware there's been a considerable, considerable backlog. Um, is there any progress on this issue or any update on that? Yeah, this is um, a, a frustration because progress was being made pre-COVID. Um, and we were bringing in commissioners across from England to carry out. Uh, there has been a pause on that, and we were also engaging because premises has been a, a difficulty. There has to be the right kind of environment because you have witnesses coming in and so forth. So we've been working with DOJ okay. as well to try to secure um, a, a venue. Then obviously COVID came and courts couldn't operate, um, but we are working urgently to try to find um, the ability to be able to carry out the, the public inquiries and I've also been engaging with the PSNI on this issue uh, as well because of its importance so I'm very keen that we get the inquiries happening as soon as possible. Obviously the enforcement side as well is continuing to do their job and to work closely with the PSNI in that respect. Okay. No, thank you and just my last point is Case and Park I suppose we're still very much anticipating an official announcement. Is there any time scale of when we're likely to hear anything on that? No, so officials are still working through the um, objection that was very recently received. Once they th go through that and carry out all of the strategy processes, then it will come up to me for um, a, a recommendation. But as yet, that hasn't happened. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> And we'll through all those questions. No, um, yeah, just a couple of interesting points. Just, Minister, in relation to uh, is there any early indications <coughs> in the uptake of the, the grant for the road safety? Um, you released monies last week because I'm keen on it, and, and my colleagues mentioned. I think it will take a legislative change because I'll use Middletown Village as an example. It's on a main arterial route, and um, there was a change made over a number of years ago. I know that down uh, around the hospital in Dungannon, there was road bumps put on the on a road and on a A class road, and I think the rules were changed. The legislation was changed then again, but it definitely is going to take a legislative change to facilitate some of those roads. Now I'm not saying it's bumps or whatever it is. I think through the road safety strategy, I would, I would hope that we would look. I think we mentioned SIDS earlier on, and I think that's an option in some cases. You know, I, the likes of Pines Pass Village as well, and and Foley School in Bonham. I could name a number of schools in Urian Armagh, but I think we need to be creative, and it may take a legislative change. So, I would appreciate if if you would look at that. But just obviously the scheme and and it's welcome because some of the road safety groups can apply yes. for something, and that's that's very very welcome. Just a couple of points I want to ask in relation to, and as you mentioned, all the capacity issues, MLPs, and all those things. See, in terms of which would be a wee bit concerned, because when I heard it, um, and I know you mentioned uh, this mention of voluntary, voluntary redundancy, losing jobs is not a good way to go at any point. Um, I know that all the bus tours, uh, just in terms of the um, piece of work that TransLink is doing now in terms of saving, <coughs> will we see a full analysis of that? Or can you ensure that we see exactly a full analysis of the efficiencies? And, and how they go about that process, because I'm, I'm worried about the jobs now. There may be people there who will take voluntary redundancy, but like I said, I mean, we know because of the lockdown, yeah. uh, you know, there was, there was capacity issues there. There was, no, there was buses maybe running empty, or there's, there's no tours whatsoever, and I'm going to use that as an example. But, but I would appreciate if, if the committee would, would see that element. Um, appreciate the Craig Alvin issue, obviously, in the test, no, all those questions have been asked. The issue just you brought up, see in terms of dealing with the um, economy minister and finance minister, obviously the, the powers were transferred over now for to take the lead. They haven't been transferred. But they haven't been transferred yet. When do, you, when do you foresee those being transferred over, do you know? 
Well, that's a matter for um, First and Deputy First Minister, as Duane, because they confer the power. And what we're doing very quickly is we're working with the Economy and Finance Minister because part of the legislation requires that you provide an evidential basis right. for the exceptional intervention. So that's what we have asked our and colleagues what, for. Can you expand on what kind of evidence you need? Or? The le the, there's three components, if I remember correctly, of the, the legislation, Carl. The first one is, are there exceptional circumstances? The second one is, is there evidence that um, there is an intervention that's needed? And then the third one is <coughs> whether First and Deputy First Minister then decide to make a determination that a scheme would be the best means of providing the solution to that need. So there's three play, there's three points before First and Deputy First Minister would be able to decide to make a determination then to um, identify a department, and that's the process the Minister is outlining in at the moment. Well, well Minister, I think the opposite end of that is many of the committee will support any support for the taxis or the hauliers or the bus and the you know, coach operators would certainly be welcome, but I appreciate the answer and respect that. See, in terms of um, guidance for private operators, uh, does that, is there any discussion in that? Or? Yeah, so um, guidance, um, there is guidance on the Department for Economy website, which uh, is relevant to private operators and also for taxi drivers. Um, on the issue of guidance, actually on the day, the very beginning of lockdown, when the regulations came forward from Executive Office, I emailed that Saturday evening to say to Executive Office that I was concerned about these industries because they would have particular challenges. Um, I was assured then that guidance would come forward from the Department for Economy, and guidance did, and it was on their website. I've also been advocating for some time around the mandatory face coverings. Um, I've always argued for some time that this needed to be a wider societal response, and you will recall that uh, I sought support for making it mandatory on public transport, but the second proposal in that executive paper was the establishment of a cross-departmental working group that would specifically engage with the sectors and look to roll it out across those industries. The latest update on that is, as I understand it, that um, uh, executive office are um, due to bring an executive paper on Thursday, putting into regulations uh, a wider um, implementation of mandatory face coverings, and my understanding is that it will include those sectors, and I think that's an important step forward, particularly given the current circumstances that we're in. Thank you. And just um, yes, go back to the rural areas, because yeah. I, I know that some of the buses, um, in terms of school transport and others using the buses, there is concern about mandatory uh, wearing of, of, of uh, face coverings, and I'm just, you know, how do we address that? Because I know a lot of people are tying, cross tying, using those services, and and some of them are full. And I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity to put on extra buses to facilitate all that, or has there been any discussion around that? So I think Translink put on, I think it was 500 additional buses, if I remember correctly, um, for this purpose because uh, of the mix between the public transport network and the home to school transport, which falls within the Department of um, uh, Education. Um, my view on this was that, you know, simple uniform message is probably the best approach. Um, I personally would have liked to have seen a mandatory move for face coverings for young people aged 13 and above on transport, whether it was public or school, and there was engagement between myself and the Minister for Education on that. Um, certainly, I also think that there's a body of work to be done around education, and I know TransLink has been engaging with schools directly, where we're seeing some young people from schools not wearing face coverings. So I think that there's a, an educational piece there as well, and I would appeal to parents as well. There are exemption categories, but given your young person uh, their lunch, um, you should also be handing them their face covering and making sure that they know that they need to wear it while they're travelling to and from school and in school, as in the cases of some schools, when they're moving about to keep each other safe. Well, it's concern for bus drivers. It's concern for everybody, to be honest with you. I asked that. And just one final point, because uh, Mr Muir brought up a point about um, travel and, and getting people on the transport and all of those things. Um, and you mentioned the key point, service provision, earlier on. But, but my issue, and it's not an urban-rural divide, but it's an urban-rural challenge, mm. and, and I welcome the park and rides. What I mean, I, um, I don't know what worked now, and we, we will learn from COVID. People, I hope that people, their attitudes towards different things, but um, has there been a, a scope and exercise done in relation to, because any of us who travel down the motorway or any of the motorways into, into the city, rural people rely on that, on the car transport. 
And if we're, if we're seriously about tackling the issue of moving away from fossil fuels, cleaner transport, greener transport, we have to take into consideration all of that. And I think there's no better opportunity over this last six months and behaviours and attitudes to try and address that. And, and I think we might need to look at that separately, but but overall in, in the context of travel. But there's certainly an issue for, for I still see it coming down the motorway. If we're going to address that, we need to look at that. I mean, I get access to um, traffic volume figures, and we are almost back to pre-COVID mm. levels. Um, I didn't expect that to happen so quickly, especially when we're still operating <coughs> from work from home, if you can work from home. So this is a challenge. And I totally agree that, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of the active travel agenda. It lends itself better to cities and towns. There is a huge challenge for our rural communities and we need to recognise that. That's why we need to be investing in our public transport network. We need to make sure that we have routes that are able to connect our communities in rural areas to the opportunities that they need to do. But we also need to be enhancing it. And while I have made an announcement around park and rides, for me, this is the beginning. And I was very clear to keep emphasising that this is the first phase of the park and rides. These are schemes that either you know, are at a point where land can be um, uh, obtained or we can do the detailed design, work to get it to the planning application stage. So I would be keen to work with councils and others to look to see, can we expand that park and ride network to make sure that it is service in rural communities? And just one wee final point here, because we mentioned, I know we've asked the committee about the, the, the Mid-South-West Regional Strategy, and we know that some of the stats, like it's eight percent of the road network. All the re all the rest of the road networks over in the east. And I mean, I've asked for a response, but the committee would like to see the, the overall strategy and plans, obviously from from the department, how they can address some of those issues. Yeah, no, I think it's important, and I've said from day one and taking up this post that we need to be tackling regional imbalance. Um, you know, it's it's a fair thing to do, but it's also really important in terms of economic development and growth of the economy. And then it also fits very much in with the Home Climate Action Agenda as well. So we're happy to get that to you, Carol. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jo. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mrs Kelly, you didn't indicate, but would you like to ask a question? Not like her. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, please. Uh, I want um, to ask the Minister, uh, well, first of all, to welcome uh, the decision around Quick Avon Test Centre, uh, uh, that's very important. It was a huge issue at local level, so it's good to see that moving on. But in terms of road safety, could I ask, um, at, I know we have the PSNI coming to uh, the committee at a later stage, but as you know, um, Chair, they've already given a presentation uh, to the policing board. and there, there was discussion around legislative gaps that are in place in uh, GB, but not here in relation to the behaviour and responsibility of cyclists as road users. I wonder, has the Minister given any consideration to that within uh, the development of the road safety plan? And also in relation to road safety, um, I'm meeting later with a local primary school, which doesn't have any road safety measures around it, nor does it have even um, a patrol crossing person. So I just wonder, in terms of looking at those particular needs and uh, collaborating with the Department of Education, um, you know, uh, uh, how are those specific areas or gaps, if you like, uh, being addressed? Um, and, you know, I think... The public will want, won't want it to see this department or that department. They'll want a coordinated response to um, their legitimate concerns. And the other point I wanted to raise was um, around um, the uh, response times from road service uh, statutory consultees to planning applications. Uh, the minister will be aware that I've written to her recently, in particular to a strategic um, a new build of uh, St Ronan's school here in the Lurgan area and uh, if we're to meet uh, the planning committee uh, the, the only outstanding statutory consultee is Rhodes and it has been the case now for some considerable time. Thank you um, Dolores. Um, yes in relation to the um, uh, dangerous cycling and so forth and other gaps uh, in provision. I have been meeting with the Chief Constable actually on a regular basis about this and my officials are working uh, with his and have signalled to the committee the intention to bring forward legislation around mobile phone use 
and while driving. And we also are looking at the issue around dangerous cycling, given the, the, the welcomed increase in the number of people out, out on bikes. So that is something that I have been discussing with the Chief Constable and I'm keen to try to address. In respect of consultee response times, this is certainly an issue within my department um, and further afield. Uh, the department has established an um, uh, interdepartmental forum that uh, involves senior leaders and it brings all of the consultees around the table with a very firm focus on improving consultation response times. So it's something that I'm very conscious of and it's an area that we need to see significant improvement on. Oh. Uh, well, uh, that's uh, very re reassuring uh, because if we are looking at um, infrastructure as a key driver, you know, um, these are easy wins uh, if, if everything falls into place in terms of plan navigation. But just in, uh, finally, Chair, in relation to the uh, commitment by the British Prime Minister around turbocharged infrastructure and any Barnet consequentials, I just wonder. I have any updates uh, from the finance minister or indeed the treasury uh, in relation to any benefits that we might get here in relation to additional funding for strategic infrastructure projects? The short answer is no. <laughs> um, as you say, there are very firm commitments around turbocharging uh, infrastructure, a new decade, a new approach. I also watch with interest as um, the prime minister talks about how fundamental infrastructure is and how we build, build, build um, our way out of this economic uh, difficulty. Uh, I have a raft of strategic infrastructure projects that I am very eager to get started on. The ministerial advisory group has been set up so that we can take that strategic focus on long-term uh, approach. Um, and I genuinely believe, and I, I think I said this a question time, I would be saying this whether I was a minister for infrastructure or not. Investment in infrastructure is a multiplier. It is a catalyst for economic growth, for employment, uh, for social justice in terms of housing provision. Uh, and so if I can just get the money, I can guarantee you that I will be driving ahead with a very, very ambitious infrastructure project and agenda. Um. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I have to drop out here for five minutes just to um, address an uh, urgent constituency matter, so uh, apologies for the next five or ten minutes, but thank you, Minister. And Mr Anderson, you've indicated for a very short question. I'm mindful of time now. OK, and, and I apologise, Minister, for this. I should have asked you when I had my opportunity, but I want to get back in in, my, in the context of tackling regional inequalities, which is my <coughs> spokesperson's role for Sinn Féin. And I know um, what you have said about you know, the delivery of low-carbon solutions. And given the transport is the second, only to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you know, second to agriculture, I'm thinking primarily of, of rail. And when we consider that there are 54 train stations here in the north and only three of them west of the band. So I'm quite keen to try to move forward, not just to Derry Coal Rain, but to look at the long-term strategy that is required for Derry to Dublin, Derry to Sligo. And the audit report has said that 59% of the budget is spent on roads. Now, it has taken us long enough to get the A5 and the A6, and that's going to be appreciated, hopefully, if we get the A5 up and running. But only 18% is spent on rail. So it's in that context of a long-term vision for the North West, uh, particularly for connectivity from Derry to Dublin, Derry to Sligo. And I think that for yourself, at least, to start to set out that vision as to how that should be taken forward. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I've allocated £50 million of funding for 21 new railway carriages, trying to do what I can um, there. And I'm also um, closely engaging with Into the West so that we mm -hmm. can get progressing on phase three. Um, but you're right, we need to be doing more. I think rail is an untapped um, opportunity and there is a need for that spine of connectivity down the island. I was very heartened at the NSMC <coughs> to see that a number of these issues were discussed. You know, we have the high-speed rail connection. Um, there's, a, there's a momentum building to maximise the route there. I'm very keen to work alongside that. So I'd be very keen to work. Last year was the Northwest mentioned in, in the in the NSMC the formal NSMC. meeting. Um, no, we just worked through things. It's quite scripted. I hope I'm not talking out of school, but it is quite scripted. Anyone who's what been there the will know. Meetings? When's well, the I've next been engaging with Minister Ryan. I haven't had a sectoral meeting yet. My okay. sectoral meeting isn't until October. But um, obviously, I've been in conversations a number of times with <laughs> Minister Eamon Ryan because we share an ambition around public transport and also um, having that as connectivity, regional balance, but also climate action. But I would have to say that 
I have ambition for rail, but we need to make sure that we get the funding to keep TransLink alive, to ensure that we can carry out the services that we can, to ensure people can get access through the routes that currently exist, while also then drawing down the investment to make sure that we can do, just as you have outlined, we can have a more ambitious rail programme that connects uh, that part of our country. Thank you. And just very finally, before we move on to the next um, session, um, your ministerial advisory group on infrastructure is obviously carrying out a very focused piece of work at the moment. Um, and I've spoken to a, a number of people, at, which I'm aware of, and they're going to be reporting back to you. Yes. At what stage will you be able to share their findings? So um, my, my hope is that they'll present me with their recommendations towards the tail end of this month. Um, what I would want to do is to give that um, a, a very quick review because I think um, there's a huge amount of work that has gone into it. Um, what I would like to do is to collate that into an executive paper to bring for executive colleagues to consider and I would obviously be very keen to share it with the committee uh, as well. I think this is an exciting opportunity and I think across all political parties um, there is the real appetite to have a more strategic approach in this way, so at the earliest opportunity. Certainly, I think as a committee, while we may meet with them individually, I think as a committee it would be useful to have that broader conversation. Great. Very much Great. so. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for, for your time. Are you staying on with us, um, Katrina? Or I think I'm with Jackie. I is her with Jackie, work? who okay. um, is specialist subject is now the Port Loans bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, very, thank you very much. So that probably means you have to sanitise, yes. do you? For yes, we do. So we have a couple of minutes just for the change around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our, our next um, item on the agenda is item eight. And again, this will be the ministerial briefing for um, the accelerated passage of the Harbours Bill. Mm -hmm. You'll find that at page 106 of your packs. Hansard again will be recording the session. And welcome um, Jackie Robinson, Director of Gateways and EU Relations, to join the Minister. Um, Jackie, you're very welcome um, this morning. Thank you for our, maybe we're still in this morning. So thank you for joining with us. Um, Minister, are you going to yeah. make a short That's okay, very remarks? short. Yes, just to set out uh, the parameters and obviously the case uh, of why um, I'm requesting accelerated passage, which is not something that I would normally um, be inclined to do. Um, as members may be aware from the briefing that I provided to the chair earlier this month, the executive agreed on the 6th of August to my officials engaging with the OLC to develop the harbours bill that is required to increase the seaports loans and grants limit in the department's harbour legislation and to do so by accelerated passage procedure. I am pleased to have the opportunity today to outline to you the need for accelerated passage and the consequences should it not be granted. The departure from normal procedure and use of accelerated passage is not something to be sought routinely, and I did not take the decision to proceed on this basis lightly. My preference is to always take forward draft legislation with the full committee procedure to enable clause by clause scrutiny to take place. However, in the case of this proposed legislation, which will be a very short and concise bill, I have taken the view that there is compelling grounds to use accelerated passage. The maritime sector aspires to thrive and strengthen post-EU exit. Unfortunately, the sector, like others, has faced financial challenges as a result of the current COVID-19 pandemic. It is important that our key gateway seaports have sufficient capacity to facilitate future economic growth and are connected to key destinations and markets. All of the region's ports are governed by my department's harbours legislation in relation to the provision of grants and loans. While the trust ports at Belfast Harbour, Coleraine Harbour, Boyle Port and Warren Point Port and the privately owned port of Larne all fund their own capital investment and are expected to be commercially self-supporting, my department can provide assistance for developments of a major nature and that assistance can be way of loan or grant. The overall limit to loans and grants contained in the Harbours Act currently states that the aggregate amount of loans and grants together made by the Ministry shall not exceed £35 million. 
The original limit of £6 million has been adjusted on four previous occasions, gradually rising to the current £35 million level, and the last rise was made in 1989. The total amount of any loans and grants made by my department to the ports over the years count against this limit indefinitely. It does not decrease in line with depreciation or with loan repayments. The total currently stands at £34.3 million. If all the future loans identified by the ports were to materialise over the next five-year period, this would require a further £22.5 million, bringing it up to a total of £56.8 million. These figures do not take into account any additional grants or loans that may need to be provided to the ports in response to COVID-19. Working with colleagues in the Department of Finance, a new loans limit of £90 million has been agreed. This has been based on an inflationary increase and would enable my department to react appropriately to the current and future challenges faced by the ports. This is particularly necessary at this time because of the additional financial pressures being placed on the ports as a result of COVID-19. In addition, as the region's ports continue to both develop their port operations and to diversify their business, they will continue to make loan applications to my department over the next few years. If accelerated passage is not granted, then my proposed legislation will not be in place in time to be able to continue to provide financial assistance to the ports, particularly in the current financial year. I am sure that you will agree that as an island economy, it is critically important that our ports are able to meet existing and future challenges. The importance of the port's role in the supply of goods into and out of Northern Ireland has never been more clearly illustrated than during the COVID-19 crisis. The region's main commercial ports have all agreed with the need for the increase to the loan and grant limit. My officials are in the process of taking the steps required to finalise the draft harbours bill and subject to your agreement today, I will then be seeking executive agreement <coughs> to the introduction of the bill to the Assembly with the aim of an operational date by late October, early November. For all of these reasons, I would therefore invite the committee to endorse my request to seek to proceed with this legislation via the accelerated passage procedure. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, can you confirm that the sole purpose of the bill is just to raise the loan and grant limit and that there won't be any other consequences as a, as a result of bringing this bill forward? Yeah, I mean, my clear understanding is that uh, this is uh, to provide the loans and grants to enable the ports to carry out um, resilience in terms of future economic growth. So if we look, for example, at what the grants have been used for in the past, uh, we're talking about uh, the renewable energy project at Foilport, um, the expansion of the Roro facilities and the construction of a deep water quay at Warren Point Harbour, purchasing of new tugboats at, and cranes at Foilport, replacement of old infrastructure at Warren Point Harbour, construction of new bulk storage silos at, at Warren Point Harbour as well. And so it is my understanding it is for these purposes that the grants and loans would be used. I know that some people have asked around SBS checks. Uh, it is my understanding that this will not be used for that purpose. That work's being led by um, DERA and obviously there has been a commitment for funding through the British government. Okay, and were there any um, concerns raised by executive colleagues when you tabled this at the executive? Uh, there was one issue that was raised. Um, what I had also proposed is that we could increase the limits at a future date through secondary legislation. I know that Department for Finance colleagues uh, had some issues with that, and so we have taken that aspect out, and we're now working together to see can we find an agreed approach. In respect of increasing the loans and grants to the £90 million level, there was no issue expressed by any executive colleagues in that regard. I think they recognise the challenges that are facing our ports as a result of COVID. Okay, and it says in the paper actually that after consideration of some voter finance issues raised by DOF, that this obviously didn't um, proceed. What were those other broader finance issues? Um, so the broader finance issues were really in relation to how um, the scrutiny of legislation going forward would be taken. So at the moment, as you know, this has to go through primary legislation to increase the, the loan limit. We would have liked to have done that through secondary legislation. The Department of Finance were concerned that, one, there would have been a lack of scrutiny, but also that that is something that would be bound up in a future um, policy piece of work around governance. Um, so we were quite happy with that. We, we know that we intend to do that piece of work around the governance of our ports. 
and we will take that on board whenever we're um, looking at that, mm -hmm. that more holistic policy intervention. Okay, so and, and you're saying actually the total amount of grants and loans to date stands at 34.3 million. So you're really close to the wire in relation to the um, to the limit. Why was there no cr increase um, proposed before this? Because obviously. I understand that there are issues in relation to COVID and EU exit, but obviously you were at that limit anyway, regardless of those two factors. So, so yes, um, and I totally take the point. Um, it's one of the things that we had planned to do. Um, as you'll remember, I was here about a year ago, just about a year ago, I think, um, and we discussed um, a grant application that we had put out for ports. And that increased the, the provision by 2.5 million. So 2.5 million was given to um, ports last year as a no-deal Brexit preparation measure. We hadn't anticipated that. So we thought that we would have had an extra couple of years, really, um, in order to take through the bill. Um, the proposal at that stage was that we would have completed the more holistic governance review and that we would take it all through together. Unfortunately, because of that 2.5 million and because of other issues really this year where the resource within the department has been stretched as a result of COVID, um, we now need to take this forward as, as a more much, um, urgent piece of work. Okay. And you only consulted with um, the four main commercial ports um, and obviously it wasn't a surprise that they were content with the proposal. Um, in normal times, obviously that would have been a much broader um, consultation. Um, are you satisfied that, this, that you're content with the level of consultation for this? Um, we didn't have to consult in relation to this. Um, I am content with the level of consultation. I'm sure the members will have an opinion on that as well. Um, but I think we consulted with the people who were going to be impacted by it. I mean, there wasn't a statutory requirement, but obviously, as good practice, you want to consult as widely as possible. I think the, the combination of the urgency of ensuring that this bill is in place, given the financial pressures in respect of, of COVID, has meant that we've had to take this course of action. But as a, as a, a rule of thumb, I always believe that you should try to wi cons widely consult on, on issues, all issues, as, as a matter of course. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Uh, within our packs, I think it's on page 110, I'm not sure the page number for yourselves, but it says the department is aware of at least one port that is already facing financial challenges maintaining and operating its port services. I don't know whether officials or the minister could give us a bit more detail about that, because it's obviously concerning to, to, to read about that. Yeah. Um, so you, you will be aware of COVID-19 and the impact that it's had on our ports. That has meant that a lot of the, for example, row row, um, come into difficult procedures in the first half of this year, and that had an impact on the income of our ports. Um, Warren Point Port in particular would have had difficulties in relation to that. Now, I am pleased to say that even since we prepared the briefing, my latest um, information from Warren Point is that that position has stabilised. However, I think in relation to all of our ports, their financial position is not as stable as it was at the beginning of this year, and nobody could have anticipated where we're at with that. And I think as well, um, you know, there's one port or one harbour there that really requires kind of urgent quayside repairs, um, which is estimated around £960,000. So it's, it's that type of work as well that, is, that they're seeking the, the, the grant um, mechanism for. There's an ongoing engagement with Warren Point Harbour and Port in relation to that, because obviously there's a concern in development and want to ensure the future of Warren Point. Yeah, I mean, I've carried out engagement um, with the ports myself um, and as we were entering into COVID just to get a handle of things. I've also subsequently had a round of engagement in respect of Brexit, but my officials are in extremely close contact with all of the ports. Uh, and I have to say the feedback that I get from the ports is that they have a very constructive and productive, very accessible relationship with officials, which is something that I'm very keen to see that we continue to do. Cheers, thank you. And just one more question. Is there any forecast or anticipation of the additional borrowings that are going to be required to assist the ports as a result of EU exit? Is there a forecast in relation to that? So if, if I maybe take yeah. that as a result of EU exit, um, we are not anticipating. So, it, so if your reference is in relation to SPS checks, yeah, yeah. as Minister has already said, that's an issue for DERA and we don't anticipate, nor would it be proper for me to make comment on that. It's another department. 
Um, but it may, however, be that some ports decide as a result of EU exit to either diversify their business or to put in place um, other infrastructure or to do other work. But it will not be it, it will not be to facilitate checking at port. It will be a lot to allow them to grow their business in a post EU exit environment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Um, very well done, Peggy. Unfortunately, if you were here last year talking about this, when you're in your own for we weren't here. Earlier, it's time is so long and we're so <laughs> <laughs> yes. It would have been earlier this year. Sorry, it would have earlier been earlier this, this year. Yeah. This year. <laughs> no, sorry, we're not right. hurting. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I talking. knew somebody was coming in on there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it does indicate the last time there was a rise. It was what, 1989, 32 yeah. years ago. So how long, how long was the 34.3 million accumulated? How long was that period? Been that that's been? Since, since the legislation was introduced in 1970. So that's a total. It's not just for one specific period, then. It's it's, it's from the outside. And just where, where does the money come from then? Where, where do you find an extra thirty million? That's a good question. <laughs> we would bid for that through our capital. Uh, so, so we we would usually have so at the moment, um, we have a capital bid for our ports sitting within the the department, and we have um, I think a facility for I think about two point five million, which is what we anticipate spending between now and the end of March. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> okay, thanks for your presentation. And like Mr. Hillage, uh, I'm concerned it's thir some 31 years, 31, 32 years that uh, this legislation has not been updated. Uh, I'm just curious, as have you had any assessment? Are there any other pieces of legislation with numbers in them that needs updated that can be done on a timely basis? Right across the department. Yeah. You know, um, particularly if it's looking for funds that you don't have to come forward in this emergency manner again. Well, certainly since taking up um, my post, this is, this is the one that's been brought to my um, attention. Um, I, I think it does seem from the outside, after such a long period of time, why was it not uh, updated? Um, the ports can also commercially borrow, um, but Treasury is very specific about the rules um, in terms of what they can borrow uh, against. Yeah. Um, so it did seem strange to me that we hadn't looked at this issue or it hadn't come up before that, but I think we've given, with the issue of COVID and the financial pressures that are on ports, and also ports are very keen to be expanding, that that's why this issue has now come to our uh, attention. And obviously we've worked quite hard with executive colleagues to try to, to bring this legislation forward so that we can increase the, the level and an allow the ports to be able to carry out the important work that they need to do that, on the issues that Jackie has raised. When the, the chair asked you, was the number the only thing that was changing in the legislation? The answer was my understanding. It wasn't a definite yes or no. Um, so there's room for change there. Uh, I simply wish to highlight. What oh, do you mean on the 90? Uh, yeah. No, sorry, no change. I thought oh, you no. meant you were asking me, was I aware of any other pieces of legislation across the department okay. that haven't been updated in, in this in, time? In, no, it was a separate question. In terms of this new accelerated passage legislation you're talking about, it. The chair had asked, was it only the number in it changing? And you said that your understanding was, uh, I am very conscious the last time Accelerated Passage went through, uh, the legislation changed or much more significantly than anyone anticipated, uh, with huge ramifications. So I am seeking confirmation that it is only the number that is changing and not other something else that we are on site at all. Yeah, uh, and I, this is a very short and concise bill. Uh, as I said to the chair, we did look at having uh, another element to this bill around changing the limit and how you might go about doing that, but it was peeled back. So this is about changing the limit. Yeah. And just to, um, in the draft that we are currently working with in OLC, there are three clauses. One is the commencement, one is the title, and the other one is a single line to increase the port limit. Got some reassurance. So there aren't any other consequences or unseen consequences <laughs> in relation to this, um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. I'm just on that because it's a primary piece of legislation. In terms of the checks and balances of what the loan can actually be used for, clearly doesn't need to be on the face. It's or is it on the face? So the 
the, oh, yeah, the, the title of the bill will be the Har the Harbours Grants and Loans Limit the extend, Act. Right, the extended, yeah, okay. So that's all it intends to do. It's going to raise the total loan and grant limit 90. from 35 million to 90 million. This will enable the department to continue to be able to provide financial assistance to the region's ports by means of loans and grants. And that's it. Basically, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other member wish to Ms. Anderson? Um, I know that um, none of us favour accelerated passage. We would prefer an opportunity to interrogate uh, the legislation that comes before us. Uh, and given the stress and pressure that our ports will be under, and we've had the ports representatives here in front of us, and we're aware of what is potentially coming down the track. In the context of resilience and in the paper it mentions and makes a reference to expanding global trade links and of course we want our ports uh, to expand where they can but we want to do it within the context of EU law as it is applicable within the protocol. Mm -hmm. So I'm wanting to ask in terms of any con uh, unintended consequences that we wouldn't be walking into the establishment of free ports outside of EU law applying to these ports um, with this financial in injection. I support the financial injection. I support going to uh, the free ports because of the answers that you have given. And like uh, Mr Beggs, I was a wee bit concerned you said my understanding. I thought, well, maybe there would be potentially unintended consequences because we've looked at ESA L1 in front of us today. And we see it's not just about the extrapolation of the reference to the EU, but there could be some other issues that we looked at the reg, uh, in the in the legislation or the regulation that we're saying, no, let's let's try and interrogate that further. So we have time to do that, for instance, when it comes uh, before the committee in that way. But in this context, I just want to be satisfied that we wouldn't be walking into a situation where the establishment of um, tax havens, um, where you would have all the concerns that has already been identified through an intensive investigation by the EU on what the impact of free ports would be, particularly those that would be operating outside of EU law. And given that we don't know what's going to happen in 99 days' time, and um, we know that Boris Johnson is very much on board for supporting such free ports outside of Brexit, then I'm just wanting to be satisfied that we're not going to be walking into a situation that potentially um, has trouble for us or difficulties for us in the time ahead. Yeah, um, so I, the response I gave to Mr Beggs, I had misinterpreted his question. I thought he was asking me a wider issue across the entire department. Um, and then, as, as Jackie has very kindly set out, uh, the terms of the bill are very concise uh, and short, and the committee will be able to see that um, for itself. In relation to the free ports issue, it's a separate issue. Um, and it's being made by the Department of Finance. This would be a completely separate piece from that. And as an executive, we have written to set out principles around the free port, that it doesn't cause displacement, that it is obviously in line with the full implementation of the protocol and so forth so that is a separate piece of work that we are very conscious of as an executive okay thank you no one else has indicated can i thank you both um, for attending today um, and we'll see you both in the very near future thank you very much chair thank, thank you, you committee thank members you. Thank you. thanks very much the the members we have the a minute to conclude yeah. oh. before <laughs> we're two minutes over Okay, we're a couple of minutes over, so um, just draw your attention to item nine, which is the forward work programme and the proposed draft um, programme, which takes us up to four debriefings until um, Halloween. What page is that on? It's on page 113. 113, 113 yeah. Um, just oh, to yeah. advise you that there's an informal briefing on budget scrutiny by Assembly Research, um, which we'd requested at our strategic planning day. And this has been arranged for 9.30 next Wednesday um, in the Senate Chamber, just ahead of next week's meeting. So just to advise you of the earlier yeah. start for next week. Um, members content? Yeah. Okay. Any other business? Okay. No, no thank you. Um, just to remind you as you're leaving to maintain social distancing, um, remove all your own papers, wa uh, water bottles, glasses, whatever else you have here from the meeting room when you leave. Um, the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 30th of September, in the Senate Chamber, Parliament Buildings, 
and obviously we have our 9.30 informal budget scrutiny briefing. So if members are content, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.